Why does it seem like unbelievers have life so easy and we as Christians just have it so hard? There's an answer for that in God's word coming to you. Hey, my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing and hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. So today we're answering a frequently asked question, which is, hey man, why does it seem like on the surface that unbelievers just have life so easy and it seems like God is blessing them, but then when I look at my life and I look at the lives of those around me who are trying their best to follow Jesus Christ, it seems like life is just so hard. Well, you may be surprised to know that this is a question that believers have asked down throughout the centuries, and there is an answer in God's word. And so today, we're gonna go off the cuff, no script, I don't have anything prepared. I'm just gonna get back to my roots and do some good old fashioned verse by verse Bible teaching from Psalm 73. Okay, let's jump in. So in this text, we see all sorts of different contrasts and paradox, and our, there are several different movements to this text that I wanna take you through. All right, beginning in verse one, he says this, truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. Now let's stop right there. He is basically giving the spiritual answer. He's giving the Christian answer. He's saying, hey, I know that I have to say that God is good. And I believe that with all of my heart. But he says in verse two, as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. So he says, hey God, I'm just letting you know that I'm starting to slip here. I'm starting to question. I'm starting to wonder things around me aren't sinking up. Things aren't making sense, God. I know that you're good. I believe that in my mind. I believe that in my heart, but my circumstances around me are not matching up. And the reason why he's feeling this way is because he's looking at three different things that he sees as he observes the life of an unbeliever. Number one, their prosperity. Notice what he says here in verse three. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. So he says, hey God, as a believer, why is it that I'm struggling financially, trying to do all that I can for you, but then when I look at unbelievers, it seems like you're blessing them with so much wealth, so many possessions, and so much prosperity. He says, this does not make sense. But the second thing that he looked at was not only their prosperity, but their peace. He says, as I can see from the surface, they live these peaceful lives. It says here in verse four, they seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. He says, God, this doesn't make sense. When I look at their lives, they look like they're laughing. They look happy. They look pain free. They look like their lives are filled with peace. But then when I look at my life, it is chaos. It is trouble. It is pain. It is disappointment. It is heartache. It is heartbreak. And he says, God, I can't sync this up. I can't make sense of this. This doesn't make sense. But not only does he observe their prosperity and also the peace that they seem to have in their lives, but he also notices that they are proud and arrogant people. Notice what he says here in verse six, they wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. So he's saying, God, it's bad enough that you're blessing them with prosperity. It's bad enough that their lives are so peaceful, but it also looks like they are just boasting and they're just proud and they're even speaking against you, God. So how can you, God, claim to be good and look at all of this evil that's going on and bless them and yet your own people who are trying to live for you, it seems like we have a difficult road. So in verse 13, there is a pivot because in verses two through 12, he focuses on what they had and what was going on in the unbeliever's life. Now he switches and looks at his own life. It says here in verse 13, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? Have you ever felt this way? It's like, God, why is it that I'm keeping myself pure? Why is it that I'm going through the trouble of obeying you and denying my flesh of what it really wants
else to do if it is not going to get me anywhere. God, I might as well just go out and just live life and then do whatever my flesh feels like doing because after all, it seems to be working out for the unbelievers and this life of purity and holiness does not seem to get me anywhere. As a matter of fact, he says, this is where it gets me. He says, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Have you ever felt that way? You're trying to do every single thing you could possibly do. You're giving, you're going to church, you're um, praying, you're fasting, you're spending time with God's people, spending time in God's word, and life seems to get worse. And to make things worse, he says in verse 15, if I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. He says, hey, I can't even express how I'm feeling because if I do, people may question my godliness and say, hey, you're a believer of Jesus Christ, then you should not be feeling this way. But then in the next verse, we see a complete change, a complete pivot, a complete contrast. He says in verse 16, so I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. He says, hey, God, the reason why I was struggling before is because I was trying to figure this out from a mental perspective. But when I got in your presence and you showed me exactly what their eternal destiny was, God, it made sense. He says, hey, they are living their best life now. You're allowing them to enjoy all these things for 60, 70, maybe 80 years, but you have a glorious future plan for us. Notice what he says here. He says in verse 18, truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. He says, okay, God, I get it right now. He says, their prosperity, their peace, and their pride is only temporary, but you've got them on a slippery slope headed for eternal destruction. Then in verse 21, he takes an even deeper look within himself and says this, then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. Have you ever been there? You're bitter at people, you're bitter bitter at God for what God has allowed in your life and you're just all torn up inside. He goes on and says this, I was so foolish, God, and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Now I want you to see what God shows him. He has the confidence and assurance that God is in control. He says here in verse 23, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. He says, God, please forgive me for thinking this way. Forgive Give me for not realizing that you're in control all along. So he says, you hold my hand. You're with me. I'm in your presence. You are guiding me and leading me to a glorious future that is filled with blessings and prosperity and all the peace that I could ever ask for. He goes on and finishes and says this, my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. So from the beginning of this Psalm, there is a complete turn, there's a complete contrast from how he was feeling at the beginning and then he got in God's presence and God showed him what he needed to see so that he could see that God was in control and finally he finishes and says this but as for me how good it is to be near God I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do so if you're going through a difficult situation right now and you're going through pain and it seems like people around you are getting blessed and they're not even living the Christian life like you, just hold on and know that God is in control. And if they are an unbeliever, whatever good things that you're envying in their life right now is only temporary and it is nothing compared to the eternal destiny and the eternal future that God has planned for you and for me. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beat. Thank <laughs> you.